Do you want to start teaching online but you're feeling a little overwhelmed, intimidated, just a little nervous to step in front of the camera, not quite sure of the difference between teaching an online class and an in-person class? Uh, well, let's go ahead and talk about it. Hey friends, it's Kate here. Thanks so much for joining me today. Now, I've been teaching online for almost a decade. I first started off with another YouTube channel, a different company. I then started my own. In addition to that, I do work for a few companies where I teach live online Zoom classes, regularly speaking, as well as having my own website with an on-demand uh, library of classes. I have a membership website. So with that, I have been teaching in front of camera for a number of years. For the most part, I see a lot of videos that talk about the equipment that you as a new teacher might need to set yourself up to teach, but I don't see as many that talk about some more practical tips or just more of those actual concrete things that we need to do to make our classes look both professional for us and then successful for our students. I will be talking about this mostly in a Pilates and a yoga view. However, know that I do in fact teach a lot of other styles of class as well, including things like cardio and dance and a bunch of senior classes. So this goes for any sort of fitness or movement that you might be teaching online or in front of a camera. For the most part, I'll just be talking about yoga and Pilates because that's what my channel's about. So let's get into it, shall we? Shall we? Before we even step in front of the camera, there are a couple of things to think about. First is your sequence itself. Teaching an in-person versus an online class is gonna be different in a couple of different ways. For the most part, most online classes tend to be shorter than real in-person classes. I just find most students aren't looking for an hour-long class or a 75-minute class online. It's not to say that you're not welcome to do that, and you might have students that want that, but for me and I think for the at-large online teaching community, we're looking at more anywhere from like 10 minutes to 35, 40. I personally don't lead anything longer than a 45 minute class online. Most people just don't have the attention span or the time in their day to do a really long online class. So with that in mind, when you're sequencing your class, you're probably gonna need to edit in a little bit more of a strategic way than you would when you have a whole hour or 75 minutes to teach. And that's not to say that you can't get in all of the good stuff in a short period of time. It does just mean you need to be more focused in your teaching. We don't wanna spend a lot of extra time talking about things that don't matter. So if you have a really big peak pose in your yoga class, or you're getting to something really big in a Pilates or a strength building class, you wanna think about what muscles need to be warmed up, what joints we really wanna lubricate and get to those places faster than you would normally speaking. The next thing you'll want to think about before you even start teaching is your relationship to the camera, the placement of your mat in relationship to the camera. For the most part, most teachers out there are going to place their mat long ways up against the camera. I do that myself. I do teach and record with four different cameras going at once. So when I go to edit them, I can choose which angle gives my students the most information. I realize most of us aren't at that point and that's okay. You don't ever probably have to do that. There are a lot of long-term professional teachers who only film from one angle and that's amazing. Um, but that does mean when you are planning and sequencing your class, you again, you wanna be a little bit more strategic there. You probably do not wanna start with your left side body facing the camera because most of the time you're gonna be working with your student's right side first. So you wanna make sure that the right arm, right leg, they're facing towards the camera so the student can see them and can follow along a little bit easier. You also might wanna think about what body parts of yours are going to be shown. The angle of the camera can lead to certain things being more viewable or not. And um, you are more than welcome to put whatever you want there out of your own body. But I will be honest with you, I don't like to do a wide leg forward fold with my butt to the camera. That personally just does not feel very uh, comforting to me. So let's think about this really typical sequence that you might see in say a vinyasa yoga class. You start in downward dog, you step forward into your warrior two, you open up to a goddess or a star pose, you do a wide leg forward fold, and then you probably turn back to that same front edge of the mat, go back to downward dog and repeat on the second side. If you were to do that exactly like that with your mat long ways up against it, that second round, your butt is gonna be straight to the camera. So instead, when I would sequence that specific sort of um, poses, I would go from downward dog to warrior two to goddess 
to forward fold. And then I would make sure that I put something in that turns me around to the back side of the mat that gets me back into downward dog and then I can do that whole sequence where I step my left leg the second foot forward and when I open up again my head is still to the front <laughs> you don't see my butt but we get both sides now, you don't have to be that specific about it you could simply say in the middle of class okay we are gonna do the second side I'm gonna turn around so you can see me better and sometimes I do that, sometimes it is just easier. However, that does eat up extra time. And as we already discussed, we want to make sure that our classes are as concise as possible to get as much in for our students as possible. The next consideration that you might not have thought about is what you're wearing. And I'm going to put a big caveat here and say, in no way am I telling you what to wear. Wear what makes you most comfortable and confident and makes you happy in your body. As someone who edits their own videos and has looked at a lot of my own content and has experimented with other people's classes, here are some things that I have found make it easier or harder for you to be seen by your students. First is the color that you're wearing. Now in a lot of studios I've worked for, black is kind of like the go-to, maybe all black. And I don't normally do all black even in real life, but I, I often wear a lot of black leggings. Black leggings on the camera don't show as much of the body as you think. Things kind of get really blended together so you don't see all of the intricate details quite as much. Especially if in a Pilates class I'm doing any kind of small rotation within the hip, you really fail to see that with a black legging. Now especially I would not want to wear a black legging and a black top. Not only are you losing so much of the details in your lower body, but then you don't even see the difference between say your waist and your hips. So I don't wear black for the most part unless they are leggings that have more of a pattern or some kind of detail on them to give the viewer some true representation of, oh, this is the inner thigh, that's the outer thigh kind of a thing. But I typically wear contrasting colors. So my top and my bottom don't match on purpose, simply so my students can really see the difference between the top portion and bottom portion of my body. And then one other thing when it comes to what you're wearing is um, how important is alignment to you and your students? If alignment is not a big part of your teaching style, then most likely this isn't quite as relevant. But both when I teach Pilates and yoga, I am very particular about alignment with my students. And so I typically wear form fitting clothes. And I will be honest, I dress very differently on film than I do in person. I wear a lot more flowy or loose fitting attire in live classes than I do online. And you might think, well, why, why am I that particular? In a live class, I have the ability to stand up and look around and visually take in what my students are understanding or not understanding, in which case I can then be more particular with them about how I am moving myself or how best to explain it so they can get there. In an online class, even via Zoom, you don't really see those nuanced differences quite as much. So I want to give my students the best way possible to see me and to feel like they're getting in like the proper alignment or the, the best alignment for themselves. Also, when wearing more flowy stuff, it can get in the way of your mic and of your like face. I'm not here to tell you that you have to wear form-fitting clothes. I want you to feel confident and comfortable in your own body and your own skin and especially stepping in front of the camera can be so intimidating. So yeah, it's just something to kind of noodle on to be aware of to pick and choose what's going to work best for you. Now one thing that I think everyone should do as an online teacher, whether you are teaching on-demand classes or live remote classes, is we really want to be particular about how we're getting our students to bigger poses or exercises. And I don't even mean like the biggest, most advanced um, thing in the world, but simply the most advanced thing that you will be doing in your class that day. For the most part, we can't see our students. Even on Zoom, when you can see them, it's not the same as being in person. And so I teach in a progressive manner. I teach up. What do I mean by that? I mean, I give the students options to take the pose to the next level. I don't give them options to drop down into lower things. Jumping in for a quick clarification. As I started editing this, it sounded like I was saying that my students are not allowed to take an easier variation. That is certainly not the case. I'm trying to express that I start with the most simplified variation of what we will be doing that day. 
then I slowly layer and add onto it, making it very accessible and very straightforward how the student can take it down a notch or go up a little higher. Because we start with the lowest thing and slowly build up. And I think this is so important because I want my students to feel safe at any given time. I want to make sure that they know every step of the exercise or pose before they arrive and they've already felt it somewhere in their body and they feel confident that they can maybe pick it up, maybe make it a little bigger versus, oh no, I'm falling out of this. But I certainly just don't start with the biggest, deepest thing. I give them a lot of time to warm up the right body parts, to get them activated and to build up into the next pose. While I said I wasn't going to talk about equipment, I feel like that is an entirely different video and I could always make that if you're interested to know what equipment I do use. I do want to point out that sound is going to be incredibly important for your students. And there are plenty of people out there that do not teach with professional mics, but something to consider when you are teaching with or without a mic is how it's going to sound for your students. So for instance, in child's pose. If I did not have my wireless mic and I was using the mic that's attached to the camera, if I go into child's pose and I drop my head down like I traditionally would and talk to the students, it's going to sound incredibly muffled. It's going to be very, very quiet. Versus if I am teaching that pose and I don't have the mic, what I would probably do is say, I'm going to push back and hold here. And I would lift my head up and say, I'm lifting my head up so I can talk to you. You drop your forehead down so I could still project my voice to the camera and make sure they can still hear me. And even with wearing like a mic like I have when I do child's pose, I do have to be aware that I can't maybe go as deeply as I want to because the mic might get squished into the, the mat or my hair might fluff around it um, or my voice itself might get really close and it might sound a lot louder so we want to think about where our voice is being projected at any given time and trying your best to keep your voice projecting in the right spot from our tabletop position let's lean back into a child's pose knees together or apart whatever feels most pleasant for you simply allow yourself to settle to relax From a tabletop, let's push back into a child's pose, knees together or apart. Now I'm going to continue to look upright and speak with you. You're welcome to drop your forehead to the mat and saddle. With that said, you do have to remind your students, and I do this a lot in my like Zoom classes, I very frequently say, I am looking at you to talk to you. I am not important, don't look at me, listen to my voice instead. So I remind them that I'm turning my head the wrong way because I'm trying to make sure they can hear me versus you know leaving my head in the same spot and then worrying that they can't hear me. And the last tip for today is take classes from other instructors online. Not just here on YouTube, but look at different apps and subscription services. Plenty of them have a free week, a free month that you can kind of nose around. It can be really helpful to see how they set up their mat, how they teach, how they approach different exercises. Just like learning how to teach in general, you want to explore a lot of different prerogatives. Same thing goes for teaching online. You'll start to notice things that feel better for you, that feel more authentic versus things that just do not work for you. And in addition to learning from other instructors who are teaching remote classes, you might start to look for trainings that have even just a small portion or the whole course is kind of dedicated to how to lead online classes. As we know, there is a big difference. So like for instance, later in this year, I am leading a 200 hour yoga teacher training and it will be online. And there's obviously gonna be a lot of emphasis on simply learning how to teach yoga, but there is also going to be a bigger emphasis on how to teach online yoga because some of us simply want to be able to do that. There's plenty of information out there on how to set yourself up for success to feel really confident and productive when you're in front of the camera. But just like anything in life, it takes a little bit of time. Feel free to let me know if I've not answered any of your questions or if you want more information on anything. And I'm happy to make a separate video on all the equipment I use. I know that that can be a big one as well. But I thought that those were some excellent tips that I haven't seen talked about as much or really at all um, and I hope you found it helpful so thanks for joining me today and I cannot wait to see you again